It's almost a full room at 2.30 in the afternoon on Friday, so that's, that's awesome. Uh, my name's Doug. I'm going to talk to you about Magenta, a project that we're doing in Google Brain uh, that's focused on music and art with machine learning. So I hope there are um, some questions. I'll try to blaze through this and leave a little bit of time for questions at the end. I'm going to talk about two different projects, um, both of them under the umbrella of Magenta. One has to do with drawing, and one has to do with sound. Um, but I want to give you a little idea first what Magenta is and, and why we're doing what we're doing. Um, fundamentally, we're, we're asking the question, can we use deep learning and reinforcement learning to uh, do something creative? And by this, I really mean furthering our own creativity as people. I, I don't mean pushing a button and standing back and watching the computer make art. I, I think that's less interesting than actually having a, a cool new piece of technology to work with. Um, there are two things that we're doing concretely. One of them is an open source project on GitHub. It's part of TensorFlow, TensorFlow Magenta. And we're trying to engage a number of people to work with us, all of you in the room, including creative coders, including musicians, including artists, and including developers. And at the same time, it's a research effort. So part of our mission in Google Brain on the Brain team is to publish papers and to work with academics. And we're pushing all of this stuff out, not only in open source, but, but in, in the research world. We have a blog. If you want to remember one URL, it's magenta.tensorflow.org. It's also g.co magenta, but it's fine to do it this way. And that'll link you to our code and to other things. So please check it out. Now, <clears throat> there are a number of questions you can ask about creativity and about art and about music and how they all work together. I've thought about this problem a lot. And I've come to the conclusion that there's a role that technology plays and there's a role that artists play. And that we need to really carefully understand that interaction. Um, also, I want to point out that this has been true since we've been doing art. A cave painting requires a piece of charcoal. Um, musical instruments are high, high, you know, highly evolved pieces of technology. And um, so I think of us at Magenta more like the person on the left, who's Les Paul, one of the people credited with creating the electric guitar, and less like the people on the right. That's St. Vincent, but you could think of Jimi Hendrix. You could think of any artist who's pushing the boundaries of the electric guitar. And I bring this up because I think it's important to understand what people do with technology and art. They push it. They drive it. They break it. Jimi Hendrix came along and made the guitar distort. Maybe some of you in the crowd are aware, but the goal of the electric guitar was to create a loud acoustic guitar. And distortion of the amplifier was a failure case. In the engineering world, it was a fall over. Yet people come along. This is true for film cameras as well, too, overexposing film. Any piece of technology you think of, you're going to find people breaking it as part of the artistic process. And I love that. So for me, success for Magenta would be if someone does something in five years with what we built that we had no idea it was coming, none whatsoever. So I want you to have that in mind, that what we're thinking about is furthering the creative process, like all technology that came before this used artistically. Um, very quick tour, given the time we have of deep learning. Deep learning is deep. See how deep the stack is. Weighted connections in a neural network are being trained in order to predict something. Um, it's also worth noting that um, these models naturally extract nice features, nice filters from data, making it possible for us to focus on um, the use of machine learning for creative processes so we don't have to build these things in. Um, by the way, this, uh, this slide is great. It's from, uh, from uh, uh, Zeiler and Fergus, uh, a great research paper from about five years ago. I um, also want to point out, for those of you that are paying attention to deep learning, um, deep learning in some sense is not new. We've had neural networks since at least the 1980s, arguably the 1960s. And, um, but they haven't always shown themselves to be the, most, um, you know, the best models for the job. Um, one explanation for this is that neural networks uh, are really good at scale. They're really good when you have a lot of data or when you have large models. And so as we move with more compute power, what we find is that neural networks end up winning out over other, uh, other technologies, which I think is, is in its own right interesting and worthy of discussion, but not here, because we have to move on. All right, let's jump into our first project. Um, this project was led by David Ha, a Google Brain resident, extremely creative guy. And uh, this project is about teaching uh, a machine learning model to learn to draw. Um, and these are some of the pictures that this machine learning model drew. Just a show of hands, how many people have seen the sketch RNN stuff or are familiar with the quick draw data? All right, that's great. OK, so um, we're going to see a little bit more of that. Some of the quick draw guys are sitting right over here if you want to give them a shout out um, for, for, for the game and for the data. Awesome work. Um, on our part in Magenta, we trained models on quick draw, and we just released a bunch of source code. 
And uh, you can train your own models. We even have a nice Jupyter notebook. Um, the call to action there is to go to magenta.tensorflow.org, jump into our blog. You'll find the blog posting. It's easy enough to find our GitHub. And you can play around. You can decide, like we did here, you can draw some flamingos in like three lines of code. And it's kind of fun to do. So please check that out and give us feedback. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the machine learning in this project. Uh, fundamentally, what we're working with are a uh, kind of machine learning technology called an autoencoder. And there's a couple of basic ideas I want everybody to understand. Um, what we're doing is we're taking some input. In this case, it's strokes um, as drawn by someone on a screen. And we're building some sort of neural network that can encode them into some other representation. And in general, that representation is not larger but smaller than the source representation. So the model is forced to try to pull out the important regularities in the data, because it's not big enough to memorize the data. And so that z in the middle, it, think of that as your reduced representation that has pulled out all the important bits that it needs to try to recreate these. And it's going to drive a decoder to recreate the output. In our case, the input are stroke-based drawings done by people when they play the, uh, the game, Quick Draw. And we encode them using a recurrent neural network that is actually moving through the sequence of strokes, trying to predict the next stroke, and actually moving backwards from the end sequence, trying to predict the sequences in reverse order. It's called a bi-directional recurrent neural network, or a bi-directional LSTM. And the whole job of that network is to create this vector, the Z I was talking about, or if you're Canadian, Z. And uh, this, um, this vector is going to be used to condition the decoding. So we have this embedding, this number, the string of numbers in latent space that we can sample from, that we can add some noise to and generate new instances of data that will then be driven through the decoder, which is in this case another recurrent neural network, though only going in one direction, from left to right. And uh, it's going to drive uh, uh, a mixture of Gaussians, so a mixture of possible places where the pen would land next. And if for some of you that's word salad, that's great. It's fun word salad. And if some of you understand it better, jump off and read our paper. You can grab the paper from uh, tensorflow, uh, magenta.tensorflow.org. So the most important thing in machine learning is having data. And the Quick Draw team, A, designed a brilliant game, thanks to Jonas, who's sitting over there, and the rest of the, the people in Creative Lab, for drawing a really fun game to play along with, and also for um, releasing the data for machine learning researchers to work with and also for you to play with and, and enjoy. So everything that we did in this project relies on having that data and running that data through generative models. I also want to give a shout out to a related project from the handwriting team, um, AutoDraw, which is doing, in some sense, the reverse of what we're trying to do. We're trying to generate new drawings. This one is trying to take your drawing and find the nearest matching icon or some nearest matching drawing done by a professional. So it's another really cool thing that you can try. Just hit autodraw.com. Now I want to do a demo. So can we switch over to this demo screen? Uh, this demo was built by uh, uh, David. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw something on the left. And then we're going to sample from the model nine times. And remember, the model has some noise in it. It's not completely deterministic. So we're going to get nine different drawings. This is a model that's trained on rain. And so let's take and just draw a raindrop. All right? You'll see my raindrop appearing nine times. And I did a nice big round raindrop. And now I'm going to let the model go, and it's going to make rain happen. And you can see some of the variety, the kind of natural variety in the model that comes from uh, uh, sampling from it multiple times. You could also just say, hey, let's draw rain like this, because some people draw rain like this. And notice the model kind of follows my lead, and it draws rain like I did, right? Um, or, and this is, this, is, this is my favorite. When David did this for me, I thought it was pretty cool. If you draw a cloud, right? In your mind's eye, what's going to happen when I let that cloud go? It's going to rain, right? I just think that's so cool. <laughs> and uh, I also like some of the more complicated drawings. Like, uh, I actually don't know how to draw a cruise ship. I've never actually been on a cruise ship, I don't think. And uh, I don't want uh, food poisoning. And there's, there's, so I'll just do that. And then Quick Draw will fill it in with different kinds of uh, cruise ships or uh, sketch RNN based on Quick Draw. So that's kind of fun too. And uh, finally, let's do one more. It's fun to use, to use that time on these demos. Uh, we can't leave without a cat. And uh, so I'm going to show you what this temperature dial does down here. We're sampling from this model. So we have this Z. And we're going to use a little bit of math to draw a new version of Z and then generate from it. And we can actually change a parameter that makes the drawings 
follow lower probabilities instead of higher probabilities. So we can kind of flatten out the probabilities. And that makes it seem like the temperature has been turned up. Like it's a little hotter. It's a little bit less predictable. So if I draw at low temperature, if I draw my best cat, I'll just give myself two cat, cat ears. The model should draw some nice round cat faces and maybe even draw some whiskers if we're lucky. Yeah, you're kind of getting archetypical cats there at low temperature. Now, I can control this with this temperature and turn it up a little bit, and we'll start to see the cat looking a little bit less round. So that looks like the cat that I draw, the one in the middle. I was always given, you know, like at art time, they were sending me off to play with the piano or something like that. This is not my area. OK, can we switch back to the slides, please? That's the demo for uh, Sketch RNN. Um, it's also fun just to see samples from this model. Uh, here we sampled uh, unconditionally, just drew samples from the model at different temperatures. So as the color of the icons get, um, the color of the art gets more red, that indicates that it's sampled at a higher, kind of crazier temperature. And uh, even in these fast talks, it's fun to just kind of look at this art. Um, the low temperature ones, I think, are really, really nice, simple views of how people draw yoga. You can actually try to recreate some of these if you want and probably get away with it. But don't try the high temperature ones at home. Hot yoga is dangerous. I mean, it's, <laughs> they're, really look at, I mean they're just really funny to look at. So it's, it's fun to sample from the model unconditionally. And uh, it's also fun to do conditional generation. This is very different. Now what we're doing is we're taking a drawing. Those four drawings on the left were done by David. And we ran them through the model and decoded them. So you see on the right the reconstructions, but we remembered the Zs in the middle, the Zs, our latent space. And now we can just interpolate through our latent space and generate drawings for all of the spaces that we don't know about. And I think it's, it's quite good the way the model moves from these different shapes. So each of, those, um, each of those reconstructions are in the corners, and the color is following the color mapping between those colors. And you get an idea that the model has a nice smooth representation of how faces are drawn. Also, I want to point out that the model is not memorizing data. We purposely restrict the, uh, the size of the representation to force it to generalize, and we add a little bit of noise. And I think this is cool. It's a benefit. So for example, if you look on the left-hand side, the human drawings that are basically good examples of the class, cat, are more or less reproduced by the model. On the right, we drew some, you know, an eight-legged pig, which is reconstructed as a four-legged pig, because that's what the model knows about pigs. It knows that pigs have four legs. Before you call me out, for some version of nose, for some version of pigs, and for some version of four legs. Also, if you draw a truck and pass it through the pig classifier, you get kind of a pig truck, which I think is really cool. <laughs> like, like, if you were asked to draw a pig truck, could you do a better job than that? It's really good, right? <laughs> Three-eyed cats, they don't exist. There's no chakra for our cats. And if you do something like run a toothbrush through the cat classifier, you don't get a cat. You don't get a toothbrush. You kind of get gibberish. So the model really is, is honing in on something about drawing. So, so that's a lot of fun. I foresee a lot of possible creative applications of this uh, going forward. Lovely if people want to hack our code. Oh, this is the last thing. If you're into math, if like you're a math geek, just look at this formula. Do the algebra. These are, this is math done on the, on the embeddings. I'm not even going to explain it. Just look at it. Yeah, wait long enough, they applaud. It's pretty cool, right? So I love the idea that this space is well enough conditioned that you can actually move around numerically in the space and get meaningful results. You can build pig heads from pig bodies and subtractions of cat heads and cat bodies, et cetera. No pigs were harmed. Um, OK, I'm going to move on to project number two. Project number two is called NSynth. We also released this uh, this week, or some, 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 uh, some part of it. And what we wanted to do was learn a music synthesizer. We wanted to actually make new sounds, and sounds that have captured some of the underlying richness and variance of musical sounds that we work with all the time as musicians. Um, people have been doing this forever. We're certainly not the only uh, use of software to make sounds. Um, here's a, an analog synthesizer. Um, lots of knobs, fun to play with. Um, what we're trying to do is use deep learning and see if we can get a particular feeling and a particular uh, uh, interpretability to the sounds that we're making. This work also, I want to point out, is a really, uh, I thought, a great collaboration between the DeepMind team in London 
and, and the brain team in, in uh, Mountain View. Uh, uh, Sander Dieleman was one of the authors on the original WaveNet paper, which I'll talk about in a second. He was a fantastic collaborator with us, and this project would not have happened without it. And I love that kind of uh, cross-collaboration. Uh, cross so in terms of what you can learn outside of this talk, um, we have two postings on our blog at magenta.tensorflow.org. Um, that point to this really wonderful AI experiment that came from Creative Lab that I'm going to show you in a few minutes. And we also, for those of you, all right, show of hands, who knows what Ableton Live is? All right, all of you might consider going to our open source and downloading the plugin for Ableton Live, and you can drive your own music with these samples. It's, it's, it's fun. It's cool. So give that a look. All right. <clears throat> so first, to understand what we're trying to do, let's, let's look back at the paper from last year called WaveNet. It's a, a paper that's trying to learn to generate audio from audio. It's actually learning on the raw PCM, post-code modulation, the raw speaker cone position sampled 16,000 times a second. And it's trying to predict the next sample conditioned on about the last two seconds of samples. And what it uses is something called dilated convolution. So you see the arrows, they get spread further and further apart. It's almost like they're being dilated in time so that the, 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 the next prediction is conditioned not only on the sample that came last, but some samples or some um, representations of samples that happened further and further in the past. And this allows WaveNet to be able to make, um, make predictions that have a little bit of coherence. However, there are some limitations to this coherence. Because the model doesn't have anything to condition it to allow it to be more stable, it really has a hard time doing something that is coherent over more than about maybe a fourth to a half of a second. So let's play, um, let's play Dizzy, please. The model's learning to play Dizzy Gillespie, trained on Dizzy Gillespie only, and get something out of it. Let's play Metallica. And then in the bottom, we trained on individual musical notes from a data set that we released in open source called NSynth. The whole project's called NSynth, and so is the data set, because we wanted to confuse everybody. And so the model sees only individual musical notes. Um, and if, it's trained, if, an, if a wave net is trained on this data, it's not quite capable of producing a single note. It wanders around. So please play the second one. It's definitely learned about harmonics. Let's go ahead and play the first one, too. It's fun. I like that bass. So what we see is that, that the NSYNCH data trained on WaveNet alone does some cool things, but it doesn't give us what our desired goal, which is to have kind of coherent musical notes. So what we decided to do was add a, an autoencoder to WaveNet so that we can constrain and help it understand how, how sound is unfolding in time. So this uh, basic diagram should look familiar. You have some input. Now it's not a cat or a pig. It's an input waveform. We're going to encode that in time using a kind of convolutional model that's not a wave net, but is also using deep, di deep dilated convolutions. That's going to give us some sort of embedding. And in this case, the embedding actually unfolds in time. So it's 16 values that change every few milliseconds. And then we're going to have a wave net decoder, the same wave net that we just saw. And the wave net is actually going to have the input audio available when it's training. But it's also going to see this conditioning information from our Z. And if it wants to take advantage of it, it can. And in fact, it does to great effect. So now what we can do is encode an entire note, and we can then decode from it. So let's listen to the original bass. Now, if we run that bass through our model and decode it, in the same way that we ran the cat through our model and looked at the cat, it sounds like the bass on the bottom. So it's hard to hear with the fan noise. It's a little bit distorted. Sometimes we get clicks, but more or less it captures the sound of the bass. Now let's hear the original flute. And now let's hear the WaveNet flute. So it's close. So now you're asking, why would you want to reconstruct noisy versions of these samples? Because now, because we're living in this embedding space, 
we have this reduced representation, we can do exactly what we did with the images of the cats or the images of the people. We can move between sounds we know and listen to what the model does in spaces that we don't know. So let's listen to what bass and flute sounds like original. It sounds like a bass and a flute, right? That's what the average is. You just average the signals together. Now let's listen to bass and flute from nSynth. Let's play that again. I invite you to go to our blog and listen to the examples there with headphones. But what it, what it does in my mind's eye is makes a really big bass flute. <laughs> right? Like physically, that's what it sounds like. Um, in the interest of time, let's just go ahead and play um, flute plus organ. I think even without hearing the organ, you kind of get it. And let's hear flute plus organ from, from uh, NSynth. Again, it kind of grabbed the flute sound and modulated it with an organ like sound. Um, I'm going to move on from these now in the interest of time. Um, these are what the embeddings look like. So the, I told you these are temporal embeddings. They actually unfold in time. And there are 16 of them. So we gave each one a different color. And then now we're looking at bass, glockenspiel, and flugelhorn uh, column-wise. And you're seeing the original waveform um, shown in a kind of special spectral representation where time unfolds left to right. And then you're seeing the embeddings that were used to generate the reconstructions. Um, I wanted just to give you this basic idea that what we're really providing are those embeddings, those 16 values changing over time. And then the WaveNet is learning how to take advantage of them. Um, now, let's go to, I'm going to go to, please switch to the demo uh, again. Demo computer, please. OK. <clears throat> so the Creative Lab team also um, just released this NSynth music instrument. You can play with it online. Um, we have a link to it. We have a link to it from, uh, from our blog. You can also get at it. Um, oh, I have, I'm sorry. What I see up on the screen is our internal link. Um, you'll find it from our blog. It's easy to find. Look for NSynth uh, sound, SoundMaker. And here you can play with this yourself. So that's our bass reconstruction. Compare that to the original upright bass by clicking here. And here's a clarinet. And then we can move through this space. And we can sit, sit in areas that are blending the clarinet and the bass in, in, I think, interesting ways. They're not all beautiful, but they're all kind of interesting. We can try different samples. I love this interface. Again, cheers to the Creative Lab team. Um, we can do a cow. I didn't mean to move past cow. Who would want to do that? So we have a cow. Let's do a vibraphone cow. So here's our cow. Right? There's our cow. Yeah, you're clapping, aren't you? Because you know this is, this is why this is, they pay us to do this work. I just want to point that out. They, we get paid. And now we bring the vibraphone in. And we've actually got a really interesting sound, right? Like, it's getting its pitchiness from the vibraphone, but it's totally, like, modulated by cows. So you have this cow modulator. So I invite, I invite you to, like, lose. If, if, you're, if, if you have a, an auditory system that works at all, I promise you, you can lose easily an hour by just throwing on a set of headphones and playing around with this. Unless you're, unless you're hacker news, and then you're negative about everything. But that's OK. Um, <laughs> let's go back to the, uh, to the slides again, please. Um, we also released a data set for those of you that want to do machine learning yourself. Um, we have about 300,000 individual um, instrument sounds that we generated from different sample packs everywhere. And we also released them in a format that has a bunch of the metadata attached to it, so you can know what the genre was, some of the note-like qualities like bright and dark and multiphonic. And so this opens the door for doing things like training conditional models, models that know about these values so you can use them to, to, to um, to condition your generation. I mean, you can use these for anything you want to. And uh, it's out there in open source. And we hope that it fuels more research in music-related deep learning. Um, I want to close now and have plenty of time for questions. Um, I'm in love with this quote. Who's heard of Brian Eno? If you didn't raise your hand, homework, go learn about Brian Eno. Um, fantastic musician. And I just think this captures um, what we're trying to do with Magenta. I like it so much that I'm actually going to read it. Whatever you now find weird, ugly, uncomfortable and nasty about a new medium will surely become its signature. 
CD distortion, the jitteriness of digital video, the crap sound of 8-bit, the distorted guitar sound is the sound of something too loud for the medium supposed to carry it. I, I love that thought. I love the idea of trying to build a new medium with the understanding that it's a medium that's meant to be broken. Like We want artists and musicians to try to break these things, to try to do new things with them. And I think that's a really wonderful interaction between technology and art. And it's one that I think is just, A, it's fun, and B, it's, it's cool, right? It's fun. I don't know what to say. Right? So there's your quote to close with. Here's my call to action. What can you do? Have a look at TensorFlow, uh, magenta.tensorflow.org. There's our blog. There's our data, discussion list, and GitHub. You'll also find links off to the great work by Creative Lab, including links to the data sets. Or you just look on Reddit, and you'll find them there. And uh, now I managed to actually save some time for questions. So I hope you have questions. I'm going to stop here. And I thank you very much for your attention on a hot Friday afternoon. <laughs> <laughs>